So I'm just going to confirm that we're streaming. Stream. Stream. There. Yeah. <laughs> I love that I get a commercial when I log yeah. in. <laughs> Are we streaming? Let me watch yeah, this commercial yeah. first. Let me, yeah. Hang on. Hold, please. Hold on, everybody, while we try to produce the show, while we wait for YouTube commercials. <laughs> All right, cool. There we go. All right, so it looks like we're on. Um, I am going to play the intro, and then we'll get started. I don't see... So AJ told me I'd see the chat in the studio. I'm not sure where to monitor the chat necessarily. Just it's all good. I'm need... watching. I want you focused on the conversation. Oh, here we go. I see it. Yeah, I don't like monitoring chats because I'm distractible and I'd rather pay attention to Mike. So, okay, uh, I am going to play our intro and we will get started. Tim, do you have an intro? No. Okay. Um, who's going to kick it off? Go for it. Okay. Uh, and how many people do we have? Do you have a number somewhere? 11 watching right now. Okay, cool. Let's get the intro going and we'll rock on. So we're going to do this and this. Everybody, hopefully we'll get an intro and we'll get the show started. Fingers crossed. This is the Art of Network Engineering podcast. In this podcast, we'll explore tools, technologies, and talented people. We aim to bring new information that will expand your skill sets and toolbox and share the stories of fellow network engineers. Welcome to the Art of Network Engineering. My name is Andy Laptef. I am at Andy Laptef on Twitter. And tonight I am joined by one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, Tim Bertino. How's my buddy, Tim? I'm good, Andy, because you are not only the center of my heart, but you're the center of my screen tonight as well. Don't tell my wife that she's, she's not going to be watching. So it's fine. Oh, yay. But no, I I'm doing well, Andy. We have, you know, I'll let you introduce it, but we have been wanting to cover what we're going to cover tonight for a long time with the person that we wanted to cover this with. So really looking forward to it. Yeah, and I don't know if he knows that he's also one of my favorite people, but he definitely is. Um, tonight, we are joined by the man, the myth, the legend. I know you know him. Uh, his name is Mike Bouchang. He was on episode 105. We did a leadership uh, series. And during that episode, Mike, I quote, said, we should do an hour on cognitive biases and how to uh, handle those. So... Here we are with Mike. Hi, Mike. How you doing? Welcome to the show. Welcome back. How you been? Uh, you know, I've been doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Super happy to be here. Uh, last time, I think I had to sing a South Park song. Uh, we did that. <laughs> he as, remembered, uh, yes. <laughs> when, when uh, Mike, when, when Andy told us that he was going to reach out to you to make this happen, I said, that sounds great, but on one condition, he has to sing us another song. <laughs> That's fine. What would Brian Boitano do? <laughs> what would Brian Boitano do if he were here today? I'm sure he'd kick an ass or two. That's what Brian Boitano would do when Brian Boitano was in the Alps uh, fighting grizzly bears. He used his magical fire, fire breath and saved the maiden's fair. <laughs> you did not disappoint again. Thank you. Thank you, Mike Bouchang. Um, real quick for the people listening, uh, where are you? We don't work together anymore, and I miss your face and your voice. So uh, where are you at these days before we get into the topic? What are you doing? Uh, I made the move over to uh, Nokia, Nokia, Nokia. No one really knows how to say the word, but uh, I'm over there doing data center things at a very large networking company that has a strong routing heritage and absolutely... Um, uh, just a good technology foundation. They don't know exactly what they're up to, though. And so it's trying to, to get the rest of the world to understand the things that we do. And I'm doing such a job from, uh, if you see, if there's a little sun on this side, um, sunny San Diego, where uh, the temperature is always between 64 and 74. 
So I feel bad for all of you folks out there suffering in the snow. Uh, yep. It has been raining here for three straight days and in the 40s Fahrenheit, and it's supposed to rain for the next three days. <laughs> I don't want to live here anymore, Mike. <laughs> Uh, we have an extra room upstairs, Andy, if you and your, if yes. your family wants to come. <laughs> I like to move or to visit. <laughs> it's a lot of people to live in your room. Details. You you'll pro you'll probably hate us in a week. Yeah, we'll figure it out later. And two dogs. <laughs> I got too many people here, man. That's, that's, we got three dogs, so that'll be good. <laughs> All right. So um, why on God's green earth would a network engineering <laughs> show talk about something as strange sounding as cognitive bias, right? So... I guess we should start with some kind of definition. I, I kind of had to, I mean, I, I feel like I have a general idea of what it is. So I'll, I'll massacre it, Mike, and then maybe you can step in and, and be our uh, expert, uh, resident expert. So my understanding of cognitive bias is, and, and you actually turned me on to this. Um, you know, if you're trying to influence anyone, I guess, or try to understand their thinking and their behavior. And, you know, whether it's your child, your wife, or your team at work, um, knowing how people process information, uh, form the reality, this might get real, <laughs> real crazy, real, real quick, but, um, there, you know, you turn me on to that book, thinking fast and slow with Dan Kahneman, and it, it was a hell of a read and I still didn't get through it. There's a couple of other books I can recommend later that are uh, easier intros into that, but, um, Basically, my understanding of cognitive bias is it's how we, and, and maybe I'm screwing up with like heuristics and stuff, but basically how we perceive the world, how we build our reality, our brains take shortcuts, which I think are called heuristics. And then that creates all these, this, these biases. And like my, my favorite is confirmation bias, just because I guess we're ensconced in social media in our lives, but it's the echo chamber in social media, right? We're we're looking for information that confirms our previously held beliefs. And that's a really great way to never see or hear new information, challenge your beliefs and, and have new ideas, right? And I think we've seen, not, not to get on a soapbox, but I, I think we've seen how that plays out, you know, in, on, on social media and the things it's done to society at large. So how did I do, Mike? Where would you start a cognitive bias? And more importantly, why is it important for people watching the show, right? How, how can we leverage this as we learn from you? What's the value here? Yeah, so I kind of got into the cognitive bias um, idea. I, one, I, I probably before I used to read a lot more books than I do these days. Um, it's amazing what, what kids will do to you in, in sports schedules. Um, but the more I, I read about it and really kind of unlocking how people think and, and how they get entrenched in what they believe, I realized it was a bit of a cheat code for, for my career, a bit of a cheat code for leadership. And you start to figure out how you can use these common ways of thinking, common, in some cases, models that people use, in some cases, deficiencies and how they reach, reach uh, conclusions. If you can unlock that predictably, you know, somewhat reliably, then you can maneuver a bit. And for me, it was kind of came together when I realized that my job was essentially to sell. And I don't mean like externally trying to sell product to people who want to buy product. Um, I have always been sort of a non-conventional thinker. And what that means for me is that I've got to convince other people to think the way I think. And I always, I tell my teams this, by the way, if you think that you're a thought leader of any sort, by definition, you've set yourself up to be uh, disagreed with by everybody you run into, right? If people agreed with you, you wouldn't be a thought leader, you'd be a consensus thinker. And this means that for anybody who wants to make waves, anyone who has observations that things ought to be different than the way they are, they are salespeople, whether they like it or not. And so even if you're an engineer and you don't you, you don't ever talk to like a, a classic customer, I will tell you today that you are still a salesperson. You have to convince people to reach conclusions they haven't already reached. And the question is, how are you going to do that? And I would tell you that, that most people view fundamentally, if people don't agree with them, I'm just going to educate you into submission, right? <laughs> I'm going to, if you just knew what I knew, you would agree with me. And it turns out that that rarely works. Rarely is that the reason people don't agree. And so the more I started reading, the more I realized that, that there's just ways of thinking. And if we could tap into that a little bit, if we could, you know, I guess, steer into the skid, so to speak, um, that you'd, you could be more effective. And when I did that, what I found out and if I'll end my monologue here, I promise. Uh, but what I found out was that as I, as I did more of that, I was more and more effective at getting people to, to you know, go along with whatever it was I wanted to push. 
And that started to, to develop a little bit of a, a reputation for me where I could get people to move beyond their positions. And that for me, that was the, the fuel that that was the, the catalyst for my entire career, you know, going back the last 15, 20 years. Convince people of new conclusions. That's, <laughs> that's a big one, right? That's not easy. Well, I, let me give you like an easy example. So you guys, everyone, every one of us has been in some presentation where somebody's trying to hawk something to you. So do you prefer like PowerPoint or do you prefer a whiteboard? <sighs> That's, that's a good question. I would say, you know, depending on the room, the amount of people, the audience, I probably would prefer a whiteboard. However, PowerPoint usually seems to be the path of least resistance for larger yeah. groups of people. But if you're like in a smaller group, I mean, like a whiteboard. So why do we, why do we want whiteboards? What, what is it about? Like if you ask, if you asked a room of people, you know, if you were in a, in a conference room, would you prefer a, a you know, PowerPoint or whiteboard? Uh, I'm telling you that that almost 100%, if not 100%, will say whiteboard. What's the yeah. number one reason you think everyone gives? To, to me, it's more dynamic and intimate. It is more dynamic, right? And and so I used to, when I was at Juniper before, I was the architect of what was known as the one Junos message. It doesn't matter that much for today what that is. Just understand that it was a whiteboard pitch that I, I gave literally thousands of times. And I would begin every one of my presentations. I would go to the whiteboard and then I would I would do a little bit of theater with the room. I would basically ask them, you know, what do you guys want to talk or what do you what do you all want to talk about today? And they would say some random things. Sometimes they wanted to talk about, you know, software architecture. Sometimes it was some routing thing, things like QoS, you know, whatever. Like, and I write each of these things down in small print on the board. I would step back, I would stare at it as if I was trying to formulate a plan. And then I would say, this is exactly why I don't bring slides because I would never have a deck that covered all these things. Then I would pause for a minute as if I was trying to figure out what I was gonna say. And then I would return to the board triumphantly and I would give this whiteboard talk that was catered to what they wanted. Now, would it surprise you if I told you that doing this thousands of times, the presentation was like identical every single time? And that that was all theater. <laughs> Now, the reason it was it, it worked though, and this it's, I'll bring it to cognitive bias here. So one of the, the things that were, so you mentioned, Andy mentioned confirmation bias. Another one that's sort of related to it is choice supportive bias. So we will inherently, we will see things that support a decision that we've made. Confirmation bias is about like your worldview. Um, choice supportive is that I've just chosen to buy a Hyundai. And so everywhere I look, I'll see Hyundai commercials or data or reports that say that Hyundai is the safest or most economical or whatever it is that I care about. Um, and so when we make these decisions, we tend to see things that, that support our point of view. Now, if I'm trying to convince somebody of, to do something different than what they've already decided, I have to overcome choice supportive bias. Like I can't just tell them like, here's the better thing because I know that they'll nod their head all along and then they'll reach the same conclusion they reached before, which means I'm on the outside. So when I do my whiteboard, what I would do is I would draw things on the whiteboard and I would, I would paste them out, right? Because we know that if you hear something, actually, let me, let me cite a different study. And I, and I, I know it's a bit convoluted, but I'm going to bring it back, I promise. So there's another book. This book's called Better. And it was written by uh, a neurosurgeon talking about, like, how do you improve medicine? And one of the things they did, and I'll, I'll get the summary wrong. So if somebody's read this and, and is like, Mike, your detail is a little bit off, you know, I I'm cooking, man. Don't don't get in the way. <laughs> um, but uh, so they went to a hospital, right? And they 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 um, audited the hospital. They observed. And um, do you know what the number one cause of death in hospitals is, by chance? Do not. You're gonna pull some medication here? errors. Oh, that would be good. No, that would be. I should be very scary if they're if they're messing that up all the time. It's actually yeah. infection. Infection is wow. the number one cause of death in hospitals. And so when they observed the way that this, everyone was, was working inside this hospital, what they did, they, they, they realized that there's these things you could do. So they made like a recommendation. Here's the 27 things you should do to, to drive an infection down. And it was simple things, right? Like train people on this, move sinks closer to the doors. Like, you know, like there's just a, like a bunch of, you know, fairly easy things that were all about how people do their jobs. So then they asked, the, they, they went and implemented the 27 things. And what do you think happened to the infection rate? Up, it down, plummeted. Did it, it plummeted, did it plummeted, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, it stayed the same. Oh, 
So it stayed the same. They implemented the 27 things and it stayed the same. So they went to a different hospital. They made the, the same observations, but this time, instead of telling them what they should do, they just said, here's the observations. What do you think we should do? And so the group came up with the same basic list of 27 things or whatever the number was. And this time, what do you think happened to the infection rates? Up, down, or the same? I was wrong last time. I'm afraid to answer, Tim. <laughs> Don't be, I'm going to say it afraid. got worse. <laughs> No, no, no. They got better because, because the team came up with their own recommendations. They weren't listening to outside consultants tell them what to do. These were their own ideas. And we know that when it's our own ideas, we more faithfully follow them. This is actually choice supportive bias. This means that if I come up with the idea, then I believe I'm right. So I'm more likely to go do what I have to go do. In the case that somebody else comes up with the idea, it's their idea. It's not my idea. So I don't follow it like faithfully. And so I'm not going don't, to, I don't, I don't pull that in. Now, let me pull this back to the whiteboard thing. So if what I do on the whiteboard is I reveal information slowly, if I put the breadcrumbs out at a pace so that the audience is always one step ahead of me, when I deliver the punchline, I'm not asking the audience to agree with me because they've already reached the punchline before I say it. What I'm doing is I'm agreeing with the audience. And so I take that entire sales thing and instead of trying to convince them that I'm right, what I'm doing is reaffirming to them that they're right. And now they have an idea that they never had in the first place. What whiteboard allows me to do, even though it's always the same, it feels better to the audience. What it allows me to do is to pace things out and to make it so that, that it's all about them and not about me. And then it reaffirms all of the thinking. That's an easy sales way to use cognitive bias in my kind of, you know, towards my pursuits. So, so real I, quick, I've got if, a question if, here, Mike, because you, you've already turned this on its head for me, because when I was researching, getting ready for this conversation, I was looking at this from all of the different cognitive biases. I was looking at it from a lens of me. How do I perceive my own? And like I said, you kind of flipped it on its head for me is that you're taking a, you know, a quote seller focus lens and you're trying to get people to think the way that you think. In, in not so many words. So do you then need to, back to the whiteboard example, do you feel like you need to understand the cognitive biases of your audience? Or can you take like a templative approach to, to how you go after that and try to get them to think the way that you want them to? A um, little bit of both. So I think the, the, the thing about cognitive biases, there's there's dozens of them, but there's not like thousands of them. And so, you know, people will think a certain way. And once you understand the patterns and the ways that people think, then you can more effectively navigate. You won't be 100% right, but if you're dealing with an audience, you'll be in a, a better position. So I typically go in with a mental model about how do I, how can I be as persuasive as I want to be in this particular setting? And then what I'll do is apply, you know, frankly, a little bit of tips and tricks to try to, to, to set the situation up um, so that I can do what I need to do. Now, in some cases, and I got to be really careful how this comes across, right? So that can be seen as manipulative. You know, I would just say if I use my powers for good, then, you know, I'm, I'm a superhero. If I use my powers for bad, then I'm a supervillain. Um, and so obviously for me, I would always use my powers for good. Um, and then what I'll do kind of secondarily is I will, I'll evaluate myself. And so I tend to be a little bit um, less fixed on certain positions. I tend to be, you know, reasonably open to changing my position on things because when I'm, when I, when I find that I have an unnatural obstinance, when someone says something to me and the force of my pushback exceeds kind of the situation, then I will conclude that I've got something else that's driving that. And that's usually like, I, I'm self-aware enough at this point that that's usually enough to trigger me to say, okay, what am I actually anchored to? A good example would be, you know, like, like I've got 12 year old twin boys and they are constantly, you know, like fighting. Um, they, they like each other a lot and they just, it's like a lot of fighting and they'll say some stuff. And then every once in a while I'll have this, I'll have like a really strong, you know, negative reaction to something. And I'm like, I realize I'm not reacting to what they said. I'm reacting to something that's inside me. And so I'll, when that happens, you kind of, then I'll, then I'll try to pause um, and then what I've taught myself is that when I have, when in, in moments where I'm clearly impacted by something beyond just the situation, I will, what I do is I practice silence. <laughs> um, and so I'll, I'll, and it's not just like count to three, you know, I will actually sit there and try to like, I'll take 
30 seconds of awkward silence because I'm like, I realize there's something going on in my head and I don't entirely know what it is, but I know it's not what the kids just did. And so I, so it's a little, little bit of, I know that's a long answer to your question, but, but like I so said, you got to be aware of it in yourself and then you got to be aware of it in, in the situations around you so you can effectively navigate. It's a very good trick is take some time when you're mad. <laughs> I do the same thing. I get very quiet. I'm like, uh-oh, something's happening inside yeah. of me. I need to, I, I need to not say anything for a little bit because <laughs> it's going to come out wrong. Well, so let me give you like a, a good example. So I, I use this with my kids, actually. I try to teach them self-awareness. I want you to picture yourself now on like a crowded subway, okay? It's, you know, wall-to-wall -wall people and everyone's, you know, kind of crammed in pretty tight. It's rush hour on a, you know, on a weekday and you're standing there and you've got your back to someone behind you and then they, they elbow you, I mean, like really hard in the ribs. I mean, it hurts. And so you turn around with like rage in your mind, right? And then you turn around and the person's blind. Hmm. Are you still mad? No. No, you're not mad, right? Because yeah. now, in fact, you probably react like, oh, no, I'm sorry. You know, I should have given you more room. Like you're almost apologetic about it. You yeah. see, your, your anger, your reaction in that moment wasn't tied to being hit in the ribs. It was tied to a story you had instantaneously told yourself that the reason you got hit was because the person was somehow careless. They were at fault. And so when you wheeled around, you wanted to blame them for that. And when you find out that they weren't careless then all of the rage, go, it just dissipates. Like that's a good example where like we tell ourselves these stories, we're sort of wired to think a certain way. And then when you find out the situation is a little bit different than you'd anticipated, everything just dissipates. Now imagine if you could control that at will, that if, if all of your responses were reasoned. Now look, I'm not a robot, so I would say my success rate on controlling stuff is pretty low. But there are moments where I'm a little bit better than I, than I, uh, than I would have otherwise been. And in those moments, I, that's when I find you know, either clarity or I find... Um, in some cases, like a, just a level of effectiveness with either my family or my coworkers or my, my friends that I wouldn't have before. And, and that's, it's, it's tied to like my ability to, to sit down, think, and then stop the way that I'm hardwired to react and actually deal with my own, in this case, cognitive biases, you know, towards, towards what I thought was going to happen or what I thought the cause was. Are the stories we tell ourselves, the biases that we're talking about? Yeah, they can right. be right. The, the biases okay. will manifest as stories. It's like another good one, right? So, that, like, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll pick up some topics that I think are a little bit controversial because I think it's, it's good to talk about. So, like, why is it that if we say that um, that that uh, middle-aged white men have privilege, a lot of people will fight you on that, right? Like, a lot of people will, and and why is it that they fight you on it? I know why. Okay, why? You said it in our last episode. Uh, <laughs> hold on. Survivorship bias. It is, is survivorship it? bias. Yes! It is survivorship bias. That's good. Nailed it. <laughs> okay. Well, so, please explain. So, so survivorship bias, we, we tend to attribute to ourselves um, any success that we have, right? So if we're successful, it's because we tried hard or because we had the capability or we put in the effort or, or whatever it is that, that we think. And when we fail, we'll find conditions that are outside our control. So it's like someone else's fault that I didn't succeed. It's all me if I'm successful. And so when we start talking about things like privilege, it's actually very difficult because you're asking somebody to conclude that maybe they didn't succeed entirely on their own merits. And so you're going against, like, so even if they're like very rational and you go through, they will agree with you that, you know, yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. No, I'm not. I didn't benefit from privilege. Like I did it all myself. Because you, at that point, you're, you're, you fall back on your cognitive bias, on your, on your way of thinking about the world. And so it's very difficult to overcome that. And so some of these discussions where we, again, we, we believe that we're, we're going to produce a bunch of reports. I'm going to show you a bunch of statistics. I'm going to give you the numbers. And then I'm going to hope that you change your position. You don't usually educate people in the submission. That's not usually the thing that breaks it breaks through, right? It's very easy. And this is, this is why we have cognitive dissonance. It's because... I have a belief that's, that's strongly held in the face of evidence that I can't deny. What do I do in that, in that moment? And that creates these, these moments that are actually very difficult to rationalize. And that's, that's one of the things that creates a little bit of energy and emotion in some of the, the debates that we have. And it actually makes people walk away because at some point, if I can't rationalize it, if I can't make, get my point across to you, if you're anchored to some you know, report study number and I'm anchored to some sort of fundamental way of thinking. If I can't get things through, it'll be very frustrating and I will 
I will actually walk away from that conversation or in some cases end the relationship. If it's a, you know, obviously we're in an election year. So it's like, you know, people will end relationships. Yeah. So when you're faced with those periods of, co- what'd you call cognitive dissonance? Yeah. When our biases are challenged by evidence that refutes it. Um, I guess we'd fall back to our biases because it's easier, right? It's harder to challenge your own. Like you, you would, you would put, when we had you on last time around survivorship bias, you would, you had said something I thought was really interesting about, you know, as a, you know, let's say as like a white guy who grew up middle class, you think all your successes in your life, not you, but the yeah. royal you, um, were because of you and all the hard work you've done and how smart you are. But maybe you started on third base, comparatively speaking, to other people, right? So look how great I am. Well, there was a lot of things you didn't have to overcome that other people would. So it that blew my mind because to me that ties into i don't know prejudice racism like it, it it seems to go there right like that's that's where a lot of that stuff is and i've had i've had recent conversations mike with people that i'm very close to around the election year stuff and i i, I tried to have and you have said this to me a hundred times you know trying to present data to someone trying to convince them of to think differently is useless but I still do it even knowing a lot of these things that you're talking about. And I spent 45 minutes on a car ride home talking to this buddy of mine uh, just about the election stuff and how could you and this and that, and the other thing, especially the, who you are and what you're from and your heritage and all that. And at the end of 45 minutes, we were nowhere near a middle point of, you know, at the end he was like, well, listen, buddy, I still love you. You're my buddy. Like, you know, I don't care who you vote for. And then he texted me later, like, Hey man, just so you know, I'm not upset, but that's, that's what happened on the car ride home. Just cause I really wanted to try to understand, like, how can you believe what you believe faced with all this evidence? And, and again, this, we're not talking politics here, but it, it happens over and over again in my life. I, I don't, I try to understand where someone's coming from. Cause I'd really like to understand them because I'm not where they are. And maybe we're both in our own, <laughs> you know, locked in our own biases. Like I, it, it's really hard for me to, to understand people. You, you had said once about, you know, when we work together, like Andy, don't assume malice. Right. And, and that might be like one of my own biases. I used to get livid if something, you know, wasn't right or somebody did something that I thought was malicious. And you're like, Sometimes people just, you know, they have their own, then you tied in constraints. Like I, I like how you frame a lot of this stuff. They're under different constraints. And if you can find those constraints in conversations, then you can start to get to the meat of what's happening. Not these people are dumb or they don't understand networking or they never manage a network. You know, that, that was my, my biases coming into that role was like, these people don't know what they're talking about and I need to educate them. But that never <laughs> went well for me. Tim, you're laughing, right? But that's what I felt my role was. And it, yeah. it didn't go well for me ever when when I did that. But then when I started to try to uh, reveal constraints, because that's what Mike had showed me, like they're just under a different set of constraints. Then we were able to find out that they weren't idiots, right? They just had different parameters that they were they were working under. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to ask Mike. I, I want to ask you for. I want to ask you for a hot take. Ooh. And 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 first off. Maybe you can start by educating me a little bit, and by a little, I mean a lot, in that I, I don't think I've heard you say yet that cognitive bias is inherently bad. So so maybe you can start with that. But my question is, depending on that answer, are there any situations in which just blind cognitive bias is okay? Uh, sure. So if you believe Daniel Kahneman, a lot of the way we think, so Daniel Kahneman, as Andy mentioned, wrote a book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, it's a pretty heady book. So it's, I would say it's challenging to get through the middle part of it. Um, but it's worth reading. And then if you combine that with a book called Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss, it will give you all the negotiating tools that you need to, to get whatever it is that you need out of a situation. Like, like you, if you put those together and use them for evil, you, know, you can become <laughs> um, quite powerful. It's like, I think pretty sure it's how Emperor Palpatine started was of course, those two books. Um, <laughs> but um, 
so no, it, it's not. It's, it's, so bias is not necessarily bad. So a lot of times it, it comes up out of survival, right? So um, like a good example. So if you talk to, um, if you take men and, and women and how they behave in social situations, right? Men will be in general, we tend to be more relaxed, more trusting. We don't really think about the implications because most of us are never really afraid for our lives. Women are in different situations. And so they'll perceive like if you get off the same floor as a woman in a hotel and you get off and, and you're trying to be chivalrous, you're like, please get off in front of, you know, before me. And then you make the same turn that, that she makes. That feels very intimidating. Um, and so like, and, and women are, a lot of that like is, is in, it comes out of a, a sense of you know, survival. Um, it's not a bad thing, right? It's, it, in fact, it's, you know, it's, it has in fact saved lives. Um, so there's nothing that's inherently wrong with seeing things the way you see them. What I think you have to be is a little bit aware about how these are, how these things come into play and then understand in certain situations when you want to dial them up and dial them down. Um, I think that's because I think self-awareness and being deliberate, if you talk to anybody about leadership, one of the things they'll say is they want you to be deliberate. What deliberate this really means is I want to rely on more than just muscle memory in a situation and be thoughtful about what I'm going through right now. I think there's real value in, in, in thinking that way. Um, in corporate settings, um, people will see things the way they see them, which I think is is fine. It means they can identify problems very, very quickly. And I think going in and having a particularly skeptical mind because you know things have never worked in the past, that's actually useful to have at least one person on the team that is going in and you know really asking a bunch of detailed questions, presuming it's gonna fail and forcing people to think through some of the detail that's required to put a proper plan in place. Now, of course, you don't want 10 people all doing that because then you never get started. So it's there's a bit of a balance in how you do that. But I think, I think that's actually a healthy, when you think about team chemistry, it's not just about, do I have people that have all different types of skills that can fill out the team? It's also going to be, do you have people with different you know, styles, different ways of perceiving things that allow you to get a more broad understanding of what the current situation is and how you might maneuver? I think that kind of diversity is really valuable. Um, and then again, that diversity will frequently come out of you know, different walks of life, which is why things like diversity are important, not necessarily because you pick up you know, somebody that has a, a different um, you know, character, race, you know, gender, whatever, but because you get people with different backgrounds that have experienced life in different ways. And those different experiences will actually come to roost in, in different um, base beliefs, in some cases, different biases, and that will actually ground out the team. So I, I think that's where things go. And then I, I, for people who are listening, it's like, oh my God, what does all that mean? What it means is you got to be a little bit aware of you know, what you're thinking, what the people around you are thinking. You should be at least somewhat able to identify why they're thinking that. Um, and if you can't identify it, then you need to do something you know, transformative, like ask them. Um, and I'll give you like a, a really easy example. So when I was at Brocade, I had a, um, a marketing counterpart. Um, her name is Vasu. She, she, she was super friendly. We got along really, really well. And I was a very um, frustrated stakeholder. And she could not figure out why. Because we always got along so well. We would have these one-on-ones. We'd get along great. We would chat about things. And we really connected. We would hug when we met. I and mean, we were like, we were friends. And then I'd be frustrated in public settings about the what the the... Um, the marketing team was doing for me. And so we got in a meeting this one time and she said, Mike, why are you so frustrated? I said, Vasu, what do you think my number one concern is? And so she quickly rattled something off. And I said, that's not it. And she looked at me, she's a little bit like, okay. And then she quickly rattled off a second thing. And I said, Vasu, that's not it either. And then she got serious. She said, okay. And she thought for a minute. And then she rattled off a third thing. I said, Vasu, that's not my num number one concern either. And she looked at me and she said, what's your big, she said, uh, you know, what do you mean that's not your biggest concern? I said, Vasu, has it ever occurred to you that you've literally never asked me what my biggest concern was? And she was mortified. And then she wow. sat back. She said, Mike, what's your biggest concern? See, we, we assume that there's all like there, there might be constraints. There might be different things that are driving people. We try to, we do all this work trying to read people, which is fine. I mean, it, it's good. It's, you know, be, be observant and try to, you know, Put it all together but in the absence of all of that it's actually okay once in a while to just ask the question right like what do you what's your primary concern why what mike why do you why do you think we don't do that is it is it like fear that we're going to get embarrassed by asking somebody a question like that or what are your thoughts 
I think we're mostly transactional. And so we work the issue and we don't always work the person. So you're inside, like if you're in the middle of this heated thing, and especially when you disagree, but you get this fight or flight. Like a lot of people, it's really hard to debate. Like I actually get fight or flight as confident as I am in, in some of these settings. For me, my adrenaline kicks in when I have a disagreement with somebody, whether it's big or small, you know, small meeting, you know, big meeting, I will like the adrenaline kicks in and I don't always think like, why don't I just ask this question to diffuse the situation or to better understand? I'm so concerned with telling people why I'm right. And when they're talking, I mean, we all know this, right? If someone's talking and you're sitting there formulating a response already, you're like, oh my God, like, here's exactly what I'm going to say. And then you lose kind of the, the, the art of, of, uh, of, of the exchange. Um, I think that's part of it. And then I think just when you when you care about the issue and you're not really tied into the person, like there's a, the, the question, like, what do you, what are your constraints? Like that's so far upstream from whatever it is you're working right now that it doesn't always like it. And it feels like foundational. We So look at it this way. How many of us have made fun of leaders because they say something like this, like, oh, let's all take a step back. Like it's a meme in leadership. Like you're like, oh, like that's they're not adding value. They don't know much, right? There's actually value in that. Now, I'm not saying that the that the 100 percent of the time that's a value adding statement. Of course, it's not. But there actually is something like, okay, what are we trying to do? Like sometimes it's actually not clear. Two teams will have a different view of what you're trying to do. What are we trying to optimize for? What are the constraints that exist? And and once you start to surface some of these things, and you have you start to have more real exchanges on what's going on and then you can start moving people past their positions and you don't move them past their position because you're just educating them on a topic that they already know what you're doing is creating a visceral connection between the person and some other systemic thing that's around and what and sometimes that's enough to dislodge or to kind of get past this this position that they don't even know why they hold it what you've got to do is create these moments that give people the 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 opportunity to change your position and all again, all just to kind of wrap up. Right? So I, I like I make my living in the, the vendor space and I'm, I'm trying to sell stuff to people who have purchased other stuff, which means a hundred percent of the time I have to convince them that the decisions they've made in the past are wrong. I'm constantly swimming upstream. And if I believe that my data sheet is enough to get them past that, then I should never have a sales meeting. I should just mail data sheets to everybody. <laughs> but instead, if like if, if we presume that's not particularly effective, then what I've got to do is be, figure out okay, what's the what's the the set of conditions that existed to get you here, and what might those conditions be to get you there, and how do I how do I surface that so it's your decision and not mine? Like that's that's well, that's what my job is, um, and it's and frankly it's hard to do if all if I think fundamentally you know if I just talk about one more protocol. It's kind of an art form, it sounds like. Sure and we got a blip. Yeah, I don't know. I got you, <laughs> Andy. I got you, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I had a really good question coming up too. It's a good thing I wrote it down. Otherwise it'd be gone from this brain. <laughs> I got a whole pad here full of questions. All right. So he's gone. Maybe it's me. I haven't been on in a while. And I was talking to AJ earlier and he told me how great Riverside's been and blah, blah, blah. We never have problems. <laughs> but every time I join. <sighs> Dan, mic drop. <laughs> Maybe Dan can come stand in and pretend to be him. Totally. I would love to see Dan. Sorry to the viewing audience. This is... Uh, this is live. Laptop crashed. Rebooting now. Okay. So I guess we will just continue when Mike gets back. I know in the past... Yeah, we'd have this whole internal discussion of, you know, do we stop and start and all that stuff? I guess we'll just keep going. And yeah, yeah. Um, depending on, I mean, I mean, most of his recording should have uploaded. So 
we should right. be able to paste it together. Frank Bouchon's browser prevented recording. Ask him to refresh the page. Thank you, Riverside. <laughs> ah. All right, he's rebooting. Let's see what happens. Do you want me to dance or something? Could do something. Oh, I was hoping you had it. All right, what are we doing? Is he here? No. Do you know Wonderwall? Let's play Wonderwall. <laughs> what about? You don't recognize this? Oh, yeah, now I do. Oh, Mike's back. Hold on. No, uh, keep going. That'll I can't. Great. Mike's back. I can't. It can't be. Uh... Oh, my gosh. Wow. That, the. <laughs> what an awesome time. Like my laptop just was like, you know what? I've had enough. I, I, I would like to leave a dramatic moment and just let that. Andy played guitar. It was wonderful. I was playing guitar. We were vamping. <laughs> Tim was about to start singing. <laughs> it's actually awesome. I, I, I got my uh, some of my workout zone minutes in because my <laughs> adrenaline peaked when the screen went dark. <laughs> I'm at, I must have got like, I'm at 22 zone minutes now because that was like, <laughs> my heart rate was 185. Trying to I know walk. Tim has a question. I have a question from 20 minutes ago that I didn't ask because Tim asked a great question, but I really just want to touch on it to confirm something. The whiteboard scenario. No, I'm lying. Before that, the hospital infection scenario. Are you saying that the people who came up with their own solution were more effective in reducing infection? Yes, because they thought it was their idea, as opposed to an external person told them what to do. Their behavior was different because the external people telling them what to do, they didn't follow protocol as closely as, "Hey, we have an idea. We are doing this. We are invested." D did I follow that? Yeah, that's right. And it's not just because they they thought it was their idea; it actually was their idea. Yeah, yeah. What's What's interesting, if, especially in situations where you think that. Um, that everybody should, once they see the situation, everybody should reach the same conclusions. When that's the case, you don't have to tell them the actions. You just have to make the evidence available to them and then let them reach the conclusion on their own. And once it's their decision and not yours, they will more faithfully follow it. So it's actually a lot easier. So in my, if I go back to my work thing, where I have to convince people to take different decisions, a way that's effective is if I point out the conditions that existed when they did thing A, and then point out the change in conditions and then ask them in the presence of these conditions, what's the right answer? They mm -hmm. will frequently reach the decision on their own and I don't have to say it. And when they right. reach that conclusion, then all of a sudden they'll start rethinking through, well, maybe actually, and then we'll, we'll you know, and they'll, they'll, they'll work their way to whatever the, the, a better decision for them is. And this is what um, you might do on a whiteboard. That's how you tied the Yeah, you're walking them through. Okay, yeah, because there was a yeah. it was an important connection that I missed. That that makes a lot of sense. It's also because the their decisions. The that, you've said this before. The decisions they made at a point in time made sense then. Correct. But but they're tied to those decisions because of some bias I wrote down. You know whatever the hell it is, availability or like they're they're, well, they're tied to a decision they made but they're probably un, not even aware of it like the way things have always been done i think that's a particular bias here i'm looking at right but i like how you yeah. tie it to it's well, a well, decision me... they made at a point in time they don't have to stay forever like here you are and you're trying to convince them of something different well if it's the way they've always done it and you know nobody gets fired for buying whatever the funny little thing is today that they change right it used to be ibm and then it was cisco or whatever but i i, I guess like I'm reading one of the, the, how cognitive biases can impact your career, like poor decision-making. You might continue to make the same decision over and over again and keep implementing mm -hmm. vendor A's solutions because it's the way you've always done it. That pre-existing beliefs based on experience, even though if those decisions started 20 years ago, Mike, right? Like you're still holding on to that. Well, we've always done it this way. We have to keep doing it this way. I mean, there's places so still let, running mainframes probably me, because me, they always run mainframes. <laughs> let me tell you like a, an easy example, right? So when we think through how you, like what's the right way to make a presentation, we've all heard the mantra, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. 
And that model that presumes that what they that what they're missing to make the right decision is inf- is information. If they merely yeah. knew, that's good. But you're not gonna that that model. Tell them what you're gonna tell them. Tell them and then tell them what you told them. That model actually doesn't let them reach any conclusions on their own. It says in the very first slide, here's what I'm going to tell you. Here's the conclusion I want you to reach. And then I'm going to litigate that case to sort of prove why I'm right. And I'm going to tell you I'm right again. A different approach is to say, is to lead in with something provocative. Don't tell them what you're going to tell them. Let them discover it and then let them reach the the conclusion on their own and hope that they reach the conclusion or set it up so they reach the conclusion before you tell them. It's a very different sales style, but, but are you more likely to change your position because somebody boldly asserts, here's the way you should be thinking and they back it up. Or are you going to be like, yeah, that person's a consultant. They're an empty suit. There's a, like, think about all the words we use to describe people who do that versus somebody who comes in and they sort of almost like Columbo where they go in and they kind of ask a couple of questions. You don't entirely know where they're going and then they get to where they're going and you're like, wow, I have like a totally different point of view than I have before. Don't entirely know how I got there. It's more inception like, right? The idea was planted there, but I don't like, you know, I, I can't really tell where the idea came from. Those are very different approaches. And then instead of imagining it in the sales setting, now imagine it, you know, put yourself in the middle of corporate politics and you're talking to your supervisor or your supervisor's supervisor, or maybe up here on the other side of the organization. Like, are you going to tell them what you're going to tell them? Tell them and then tell them what you told them? Like, is that really going to be effective? Because I've been in this, that supervisor's supervisor chair. When people come up and they and they tell me what they're going to tell me, and as soon as they tell me what they, if they when they tell me what they're going to tell me, you know what I'm doing? In my head, I'm thinking of all the reasons that they're wrong because they don't understand yeah. this, they don't understand <laughs> that. Yeah. <laughs> so they they actually they hearted me by going mm. in with that approach. So now it's actually more difficult for them to convince me because I'm giving into my own cognitive biases, which is like, you know, don't you tell me what I'm going to like because you don't know me. This is my position, right? Like. Like it actually steals me against the, against um, the, you know what, what they're trying to convince me of. It, it's a, but it's it's very common, right? If you go to like like almost all these presentation classes, that's, they all tell you to do the same thing, and I'm just telling you that that that, that works in some cases, it doesn't work in all. I'm not saying to change what you how you present all the time, but I am saying be aware of what you're walking into, and maybe be thoughtful about which tool is the right tool for the job, you know, in, in whatever the situation is. I think I know the answer to this question, but how do you pull them along to plant those seeds? For me, I paste the information out. So I put breadcrumbs out because I'm, and I, and I let them discover on their own. Right. So if I believe fundamentally, so even in this conversation, by the way, I've been doing it right. I, my pacing. Come on. You're hacking us. Yeah, I am. I'm hacking (laughs) and I'm hacking and truth. I'm hacking the audience, but I'm doing it intentionally. So when I say things slow enough and I'm, so I'll be more verbose, I'll be more expressive. I will show my work in more detail and I will wait longer until I reveal the punchline so that by the time I reveal the punchline, everybody's there before I am. There's nothing I've said in the time that we've been talking where I went straight to the punchline. Everything I've done, I've intentionally taken circuitous paths I've used storytelling to get there. I've said thank one you. That's thing. what I was looking for. So I, I think your superpower and your trick, and I've been studying it the past six months, is storytelling. I I've seen you do it masterfully, and and one or two other folks, and I've been dabbling on my own. But storytelling seems to be a way to disarm people, and they forget. You know, the, this book I'm reading, it's like when somebody says, hey, let me tell you a story, everybody gets quiet and listens. Like it's just because we are story driven people from forever and ever ago. And it seems to be this magical hack of getting people. If if, if people are going to listen to you, like you said, like somebody comes in and they're going to tell you what they're going to tell you. You're not listening already. You're like, screw you. You don't know what you're talking about. And I'm right. But if somehow they can compel you with a story and now get you in this narrative and now all of a sudden you're in imagination land and you're going along for the story because you have no other choice because that's how our brains are wired. I, I think that's the key, right? That's how you can pull people along and put breadcrumbs and and, and get them to start to see things slowly is through story. I, I love how you speak in story. I, I find it very effective. Well, let me give you two examples. So imagine that you hear a song on the radio you've never, you've literally have never heard before. But even the way it's going, you sort of know what the next note is likely to be. Now, you may not be 100% right, but you know kind of where it's going. Because 
these stories or songs or whatever, they have an arc and that arc allows me to predict what is next. Picture yourself watching a movie, you know, 10 minutes in, you're trying to figure out what the plot of the movie is and they've got, and, and this is what makes the, the twist so effective is that it's, it's not what you expected, but the twist only works because you had an expectation. You're watching it play out and then you have, it's when you, when you, when you use these, these moments like theatrically, you can have great effect on your audience. It turns out you can do the same thing with people, right? When you're, when you're trying to work towards a, a conclusion, like if you have a story, that story has an arc and people will follow. Again, I'm doing the same thing I just told you. All I'm doing is repeating the same thing I told you, but I told it in stories before. And now when I go and lay it out, it's like, you already know where I'm going. And so then when I reach my conclusion, you will have been there two steps before I get there. And it looks like I'm just walking into the clearing. When in fact, I'm the one that plotted the course the entire time. So our brains take shortcuts that Dan Kahneman called, what was it? Thinking one or whatever the hell. System, system one, one thinking. System, system one, one and system yeah, two. Right. Yeah, yeah. It takes shortcuts, which he called heuristics. And mm -hmm. there are ways that our brain just take all this information and tries to distill it down into something more simple and understandable. I think those heuristics create biases. Those shortcuts create these uh, gaps in, in rational thinking that we have. And then we get stuck there. So I guess awareness of all this is step one. And then storytelling to me seems to be where you can start to, once you've un, once you understand how people think and why bombarding them with information and data sheets is frustrating and doesn't change anything, then maybe you can leverage storytelling to make progress that you couldn't make before. Does that, does that sound fair? Like, should people be studying storytelling after they learn about cognitive bias? Yeah, I, th I think it's, but it's really about like, how do you get information to somebody in a way that they can absorb based on where they're at? And stories are a, a great way to do it because I'm not talking to you about the moment. I'm talking to you about something that's, maybe you know it's related, but it sounds like it's different. It's somehow far afield. It's... Um, frequently, like I'll draw, like one of the things I do with my teams is I draw my personal experiences because I try to make it so that it's it's real and it's things I've actually done. And so that makes it approachable. And then when I go and tell those stories, then you connect with the story and then the story itself has a has a meaning. You don't need the author to tell you the meaning of the story. You, you I mean, we've, we've all been through these classes. You you read the story, you kind of you develop a sense for the meaning. Um, and then when the when I come along and, and offer the meaning, again, it's, it's your conclusions, not mine. Like these are the ways, this is how you intercept people where, where they are. Um, and then I guess to Tim's points early on, I mean, he asked the question, you know, he's, I, he said I flipped it on its head because I, he thinks about like, how do you break, break away from your own bias, right? That's, that's like a, a good way. And I'm talking about how do you leverage other people's biases to be more effective? You know, then the question is, how do you hack yourself? Because I will tell you that it's there's there's very few things that are as destructive as being like anchored in your own way of thinking and, and incapable of movement. And if you can't identify that that's where you are, then you'll be one of the ones that's left behind because you're the you're the dinosaur. You're the one that, that couldn't change. And it's where we all by default, right? So we have to actively fight it. At least that's how I feel. I am constantly seeking out people. I disagree with and trying to understand them because I do not want to become stuck You're very in my good ways at it too. and the dinosaur who me. Yeah. It's seeking out people that disagree with you, <laughs> <laughs> but Mike, you, you actually, uh, that last statement, I don't think you could have laid those breadcrumbs any better because you talked about hacking yourself. So what I wanted to ask you was in your career in it in leadership, what are some specific scenarios or situations that you've come across that you have really had to slow down and be aware of potential biases before you make a big decision? Um, probably the, the, the biggest, there's two that were like really foundational in my, and I've shared these in, in various settings. So apologies. If this, some of this is a repeat, but there was a woman, Michelle Batia, who worked with me when I was at Juniper, when I was kind of at this, pretty big inflection, like a, a kind of a, a step function growth point for me. I had taken on strategy and operations and business planning and, 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 and I actually quite, quite intentionally 
was taking all this stuff on because I was like, look, if I control all of this, then I will be indispensable. I was, I made myself yeah. the center of everything and I was secretly. You were building trying. your empire. I was, and I was doing it by, by trying to own everything. And I was late on everything as a result because I was so instrumental to everything that everything ran through me. I couldn't keep up. And so she told me we had a strategy deliverable and she, I was late on it. And she said, you know, you're always late. And I, I basically said, don't you know all the things I'm doing? And I, I snapped at her and she said something back that was, that was sharp, but needed. And I dropped an F-bomb in her office and she looked at me and she said, get out. Don't you ever talk to me like that. So I slammed the door. I walked out. I stood outside her office and it took me, you know, maybe a minute to, to, to have the sort of the world ending shame on me. I, it was, it was, it was like so wildly inappropriate. And I, I, I opened the door and I, I apologized and she said, like, don't, don't talk to me like that. It's inappropriate. I'm like, I know. And then she gave me the, the kindest, most courageous advice anyone ever gave me. She said, you think you're helping you helping yourself by doing all these things, but nobody knows all the things you do. All they know is that the thing they're waiting on is always late and you're always grumpy because you don't sleep. And she said, you think you're helping your career. You're actually killing it. And that, I mean, that cut me like a proverbial knife. I, and it forced me to rethink all, like I, I had survivorship bias is really powerful. I had ascended through a couple, two grade, two, two promotions and I had accumulated all this power thinking that I was doing all the right things. And so I was more resolute in the decisions I was making because I had seen some traction. And when she came in and gave me a counterpoint that I, was undeniable, and it was surrounded by this moment where I had acted like an absolute, like inappropriate oaf, um, I was laid bare in that moment. And it forced me to rethink everything, all of my assumptions. And that was the visceral connection I needed to be able to set aside like any survivorship bias I had and then any confirmation by like all the other biases that sort of go along with that. Um, that moment did more for my career than any other moment in my entire career. Um, and it, it changed the way. So then now like my, I, I actually don't build empire I, since that moment, I've never consciously built an empire. I'll, I'll stray. I'll make mistakes now and again. Like I, I'm a deeply flawed individual and a, and a, and a, a probably more flawed leader. But I, I, I am forever aware of 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 what I'm taking on and how I'm serving myself and how I'm serving the team around me. Um, and that is that that requires separation and a a very sober assessment. Um, and and that for me personally. I have those these moments of of clarity, these moments of let's say you know sobriety. Late at night, when I'm like it's me in my bed, I'm getting ready for sleep, and I have, or if I'm driving sometimes, or I travel a lot. So if I'm on an airplane, where I just I'll put my headphones on and I will just block out the world, and then I'll have these moments where I'm forced to be really truthful with myself. And in those moments, when I'm at my very very best, I will reach conclusions that I can carry with me when I'm during moments where I'm not at my best. And so it's about developing conviction when I'm not in the moment and then having the discipline to stick by my conviction when, when the, the, the moment arises and that's, it's served me well in my career. It's served me even better in my home life. Um, and, and for me, I mean, Michelle, she's not gonna be listening cause I don't think she listens to podcasts. But if anyone knows Michelle Batia, I mean, like tell her that she paid the greatest service to me that anyone in my life has ever done because she, she changed everything about me. And, and it was because she had the courage to, to tell, to say what needed to be said and to do it in a way that was, you know, forceful enough to, to, to knock me out of my, off my perch, but then kind enough to pierce the armor that I had essentially put up around me. Wow. It, you know, Mike, and I think that's where when, when dealing with these biases, I think that's where leadership is especially difficult because I, I'm thinking about just some real world day to day scenarios. You're, you're having to make big decisions around things like hiring, things like business decisions that I think you really need to slow down and understand how you're thinking and what the end goal is and, and how to get there in a fair way. 
I think that's right. Like it's, it's, it's hard. Um, for me, muscle memory is like the, the, and the, I mean, cognitive bias is muscle memory. Like I, we all fall into muscle memory, the way we behave. Um, you know, companies have it too. You know, we call it culture when it's at a company level, but it's how you behave in the absence of direction. Mm. And so we have this and then, like, and, and then, you know, and, and sometimes it serves us well, uh, again, it's not always bad, but in the moments when you, when you need to be more deliberate or you need to reach a different outcome, it's like, do you have the awareness? Do you have the tools to separate yourself and make a decision? And I will tell you that the average person does not, and it's not because they lack the capability, but they do lack the, the awareness. They, they're not, they don't exist in the moment. Um, and so if, if, if it is, and I guess I, I want to say this because it's, the, the, the difference between being wildly effective and let's say mediocre is actually not like, you know, oh, you have to have all this talent or all this experience or maybe extra training. It's not necessarily that way. In some cases, it's just being aware and doing the small little things that make you more effective. And so if you're navigating a career and you build up, you know, you, you look at Steve Jobs as your, as your leader or pick, you know, leader of choice and, and you if you try to hold yourself to whatever standards they have you're you're probably doing yourself a disservice if, um, efficacy can be gained with a lot smaller incremental steps um and it's going to start with just being thoughtful there is no there's no grandmaster plan there's no you know archetype that's good for all such all, all situations all settings what you've got to do is be authentically you and then that's going to come out of being at least aware of who you are and then why you are. And then if you have the ability to, to work within those constraints, then you will be far more effective as a leader, far more effective as an individual and, and far more capable of, of um, getting people around you to, to reach some of the same conclusions that have kind of got you to where you are. So we've got an interesting question in the chat from Zatharian and you talked earlier, Mike, about kind of your techniques for selling something to someone or selling an idea or trying to get somebody to where you think you want them. And you talked about storytelling and the uh, leading them with breadcrumbs. And, and the question is, has have you encountered anyone in a conversation you've been having or maybe a disagreement that that person has tried those similar techniques on you while you're actively doing the same. Um, Have you been bouchonged? Yes. <laughs> I, I, yes. I, 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 I have. Um, so one of my, one of my mentors was a guy named Spencer Green, and Spencer Green is was uh, I mean just very very thoughtful. He he kind of showed me a lot of things and there's been times where I could feel him manipulating me and like, I don't necessarily want to be manipulated, but I, you could see where he's going and see, so you, you kind of let it happen. Um, but he was, he was wildly effective at, at doing this with me. Um, there's been other folks on my, in my organizations that at times have, have like Kathy Gadecki is she's, she's been my go-to person for, I want to say 15 years now. Um, and she knows how to manage me. So she knows when to let me kind of just go and she knows when to, to apply the constraints and, and how to, how to kind of manage me a little bit in, in terms of like my expectations and how to make things my ideas. She's particularly crafty at, um, so I, I, I believe I'm a good communicator. So I, I have a lot of ego around my writing and she's one of the few people that's figured out how to edit my writing and like move me off of my positions without me getting defensive about here's why I wrote it that way. <laughs> and she's very good it was, like it. So she'll do the same things. I don't know if she does it with the same intent that I do, but she definitely uses some of the same tips and tricks. Um, and when it happens, I'll be honest, when I notice it, it actually makes me smile. It doesn't make me frustrated because mm -hmm. I imagine the question behind the question is, if you know, this is being done to you, does that, does that make you dig in or does that make you lean into it? That's my, and, yeah. And for me, when, when you realize it's happening, especially when it's, the people, when you know someone is, is we have a relationship and you can tell that they're, you know, let's say pure of heart. When it happens, it makes me smile because you look and you're like, this person is actively working with my faults 
to help me reach a better place on my terms and not their terms. That's actually a great kindness. So I, I will, when I notice it and when I'm at my best, I will be thankful. When I notice it and I'm not at my best, I will be, uh, let's say arrogant. And when I don't notice it and I'm not at my best, I will be at times, I will be frustrated. So Andy, hey, you brought something up at the beginning of this. I planned on asking you this question. You already kind of led us into it, but you only really touched on it. So I, I want to push on it a bit further. You're asking me a question on Mike's I'm episode? asking you, Andrew. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, boy. And like I said, you kind of led us into it, but I, I want you to, to go a bit deeper. Which cognitive bias do you think you are up against or think about the most? What, which one do you think affects you the most? Affects my way of misperceiving reality or affects me in business when I'm trying to deal with people? Uh, interactions with people. I, my, my experience in at least the vendor world has been, it's, it's very, very difficult to pull people off of their preconceived notions, their previously held and, and currently held beliefs. And I failed miserably at trying to throw information at them. Um, so I, you know, what, what I learned in the two years working with Mike has really been eye-opening and valuable and invaluable. And, and it's why we wanted to have Mike back because, you know, th this, the awareness of these concepts and then some workarounds and if you can spin in some storytelling, it can really change the outcomes with your friends, with your kids, with a girlfriend uh, with people in the organizations you work in, you know, this is an engineering type show. So, I mean, Tim, you were at a pretty high level as an architect and, you know, there might've been times where you had to try to convince the people who signed the checks of a solution that you knew was right. And I mean, I'd almost throw that back on you. Have, have you, have you been frustrated trying to convince people like you knew you were right as an engineer because really, that's what I want people to take away from this who are listening to this. How can you apply this in your own life? And I think we've we've spelled that out pretty clearly. But like for the engineer, you know, you can say the solution is the best thing, and, and you know, we need to to buy this. Like, have have you run into this? Have you had have you had people on the other side of the table you knew were wrong and you struggled to convince? Absolutely. Yeah. I think what has been tough for me the most in the past is that I may feel very strongly about something. I feel like I've researched it. It just makes sense. But in the past, there have been times where I have a, a difficult time articulating that. And I, I get frustrated sometimes to the point. It's just like, why don't you just see it my way? I, I, feel, I feel like there shouldn't be another way than this one. So yeah, th that's been difficult. I think something that is probably wrong, but I've leaned into in the past is that I've tried throughout my career to build up like credibility credit mm -hmm. and that I do things a certain way and I probably don't ruffle a lot of feathers and I, I just build a career out of, I don't know if this is the right thing to say, killing people with kindness <laughs> yeah. and, and just trying to constantly get people on, on my side. But I, I would say, yeah, that's the biggest thing. And, and from a technical conversation, I I've had that difficulty where it's like, I feel like I understand something. And then we hire somebody new, bring somebody new onto the team. And my job becomes teaching that person. And I almost shit my pants. Cause it's like, I understand it in my head, but how do I get this information to this other person? in a way that they're going to understand. And that's where I want to bring up what, what Mike said is that you can be the smartest person in the room and throwing information at someone isn't necessarily the best thing to do. It's 
getting creative, telling that story, finding a way for someone to get to the conclusion on their own that you want them to get to. And you like how I answered the question by putting it back on you? <laughs> hey, that's what I did to you in my very first uh, episode that you had me on three years ago. So it's another, it's yeah, another trip payback, back I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my mirror. Pew! Um, I, I think we're just about time, if not over time. Not that we couldn't go all night if we wanted to. Um, Tim, did you have any? I know you always have some amazing questions there. Is there anything you wanted to touch on before we start to wrap? Or Mike, if there's anything that we should have asked you that we didn't. No, we've hit everything I've wanted to touch. Yeah. Awesome. Mike, <laughs> what are we going to talk about next time? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> we can go any, we, I, I always, I always give you a hard time. Like br bring me back on. It's not a, like, I, I, I enjoy just the conversations. Um, I, I would, I would say that there, there's a lot that's here and you tend to hit the same, couple of biases, but if you just do some basic searching, like if folks are out there, it's actually interesting. And you'll see some of the words that, that our industry tosses about the socials. A lot of these things play in, they're like a, a, a subset of the overall cognitive bias topic. I would encourage people, you know, just do a, a simple search for list of cognitive biases, and then you'll start to see what some of them are. And then it's not that you have to master all of them, but it's worth looking at a couple of them. And I will tell you that if you can be thoughtful about how you frame up conversations, um, about how you approach conflict, because that's really where they this kind of comes to play. Um, or I guess in some cases, when everyone's agreeing, you should maybe you need to question whether everyone's agreeing out of the merits of on the merits of the idea, or whether they're agreeing out of the out of something else that's there and reinforcing. This is actually how companies go go sideways. Um, but it's worth looking through that, and I think developing a little bit of a personal strategy. Um, I will tell you that if if you spend, you know, let's say five or six years it really honing it. Um, that means you only have about 15 more years to go after that. So you'll always be a work in progress. Um, but even a, a few extra successes along the way, or a few easier conversions as you move people to a different way of thinking, um, those will propel a career. And in some cases they'll propel a, a family in ways that are deep and meaningful. And so I, I, I do think it's in people's best interest to at least be aware of what's going on. Um, and then if you can pick up a, a, a tip or two along the way and, and learn how to work within that, then that will make you like wildly effective. And we've mentioned, you know, the Daniel Kahneman thinking fast and slow, read Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Um, Cause that guy, like you're gonna read that book and you're gonna say, there's no way this thing works. And then you're going to put it into use with someone and you're going to be like, oh my God, I can't believe that just worked. Um, so read those two. And then the last one I always recommend is the book Switch by Dan and Chip Heath. If you read those three, that's like, I would say that's like 50% of, of my leadership foundations. Once you have that, then you don't need me. And around around the uh, thinking fast and slow stuff, everything we talked about, there's, there's two books that um, I think Yvonne turned me on to that are at least... I think they're much more accessible than Kahneman's work. His work is the Bible of it, right? But I think I got halfway through it and just smashed my head into the wall and gave up because it gets really tough there in the middle. But there's two books, Think Again by Adam Grant and Blink by mm -hmm. Ma uh, Malcolm Gladwell that are way more accessible based on the same information, much shorter, much more condensed, a little more succinct and gets a little less into the deep science of it. Um, but I, I really found those um, helpful as well. Um, Mike, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for coming on again. This has been fantastic. Um, we have a bunch of cool stuff coming up. Um, we have a cool announcement coming up that we can't talk about yet, but stay tuned for a possible, um, appearance of some art of net Eng folks somewhere. Um, we have a new merch store, which is pretty sweet. We have some new stuff up there. We refreshed it. We have a new vendor. The quality is better than the old vendor. Um, the links to all of our things will be in the show notes. Um, but AJ did an awesome thing and created one of those there link trees. So if you go to link tree, one of them, um, their link, trees. one of them, their Nikki talk link trees, yeah. Link tree art of net Eng. It's literally got links to every single thing that you could ever want to see, listen to consume, interact with our, it's all about the journey discord server where we have thousands of folks in there supporting each other, studying, 
Uh, we have a work with us link in there. If you are a potential sponsor or vendor or business that wants to work with us. Um, and I also want to mention to definitely check out our um, Cables to Clouds podcast. Um, some of the smartest folks in the cloud space um, talking all things cloud. Um, you know, hybrid is the future. If you're not in cloud, you will probably be um, in cloud soon. And the folks at Cables to Clouds just, um, I really like how they approach it. It's very networking centric. It's very uh, introductory. It's it's easy to consume. I follow them and I love to complain about cloud. So um, <laughs> it's a great show for anybody. And if you really want to see their personalities come to the forefront, listen to their uh, bi-weekly news podcast because they they read the news, but then they give their own uh, ideas and spin and there's a fair amount of snark and it, it's it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed their new stuff too. So thanks uh, so much everybody for watching Mike. Thanks again for coming on Tim. Always great to see you and uh, we'll catch you next time on the art of network engineering. All righty. I'm going to stop recording once you cut the stream. Thanks for anybody who's still on out there. Thank you so much. I guess I should say thank you all. All righty. Stop.